record. Okay. Um, drop in the chat if you can see it <laughs> or let me know. We can uh, see. Thank you. Yes. Okay, wonderful. So we talked about um, critical thinking, right? Can anybody tell me what their definition of critical thinking after watching the video, reading that article I sent, us talking about it for an hour, maybe reflecting on it afterwards. What do you think critical thinking is just to get a gauge? Anybody? Um, thinking um, in a way where you're always analyzing and conceptualizing and yes. trying to take things a step further. Yes, beautiful. That's exactly it. I'm going to, I'm not going to make jump to conclusions and make assumptions, right? Uh, or just go off my biases or preferences. I'm going to sit, I'm going to actually analyze. It. I'm going to take notice. I'm going to find out more information by asking questions. And then I'm going to make a conclusion. That's critical thinking. And so I want you to incorporate critical thinking as a journalist, editing with a critical eye, right? It's a technique. You're going to edit with a critical eye. So what does editing mean? Just a basic definition. What does it mean, anybody? When you edit something. Uh, it's, <clears throat> it's making changes to uh, mm -hmm. something, really. Right, right. It's making changes, right? What does editing mean? You're editing when you prepare content for publication and distribution. That's it. So whether it's television, radio, online, push notifications, streaming content, any of that stuff. I don't know if you can really stream content. You can edit it afterwards. But you're editing when you prepare content for publication distribution. That's what it even means to be an editor. So it means you correct things, right? Maybe you correct grammar, you condense things. Maybe this first paragraph is just a lot of clearing, clearing the throat. Maybe I can just make it shorter, right? I can condense things. I modify things when I'm editing. Uh, maybe I'm modifying the order of the, the story. Maybe I think that we should get to the point faster. So I modify it um, or I'm removing parts or I'm adding part. We need more context. We need more of what the environment looks like. So that's what editing means. When somebody asks you to edit a piece of content, you are preparing it for publication. You are preparing it to be distributed and whatever format or platform you're distributing for and you do it by correcting, condensing, modifying, adding and removing. Is that clear? Yes, ma'am. Good. Okay, good. So what is um, having a critical eye mean, right? What does that mean to edit with a critical eye? Well, number one, I want to be very clear. It does not mean that you are fault finding. It does not mean that you are being judgmental, meaning negative, critical, right? And automatically just disapproving something, right? They put it on my desk and, oh, it's nothing is ever good enough. We don't do that. But what it does mean is it means that you're using critical thinking. It means that you know how to filter data, determine what is needed in that story and what is not needed in that story. It means that you look for things that are perhaps obvious or perhaps subtle. Oh, one second, Justin's coming. Sorry. Okay. All right. Hey, Mr. Darden, if you can hear me. I can hear you. My bad. I was. Hey, no worries. Was... You don't owe me an explanation. Okay. So we were just talking about um, what is having a critical eye mean. So we know that it doesn't mean that we just automatically disapprove things and we're negative, but we know it means critical thinking. We're going to filter stuff, meaning we're going to decide what is needed, what is not needed. We're going to look for things that are obvious and subtle when it comes to our biases, right? So do we have a preference towards men versus women? Do we have a preference towards black versus whites? Do we have a preference towards American versus non-American culture? And does that somehow subtly seep into what we're writing? And if it does, as an editor, it's your responsibility to take that out, right? To be fair and balanced. And it does mean that you ask questions. When you are editing with a critical eye, you're gonna ask questions. So we're gonna do an exercise to help you do that today. It means that you clarify, you make things very clear and you provide context around it so that people understand you clarify. And an editor with a critical eye, when they edit critically, essentially they encourage and manage the iterative process. And what do I mean by iterative? What do you think iterative means? Could you repeat the word? Iterative, I-T-E-R-A-T-I-V-E. -E. The iterative, an iterative process. You're gonna hear that a lot. People say that something's an iterative process. It means that you do it, 
that you improve upon it, right? So you, you take note, you critically analyze your note that it, this could be better, this could be taken out, and then you repeat. You do, you improve, you repeat. And so oftentimes, pretty much most journalism works that way. It's an, it's an iterative process where I, I do it, I improve upon it, it's edited, and then I repeat it again. Maybe I, I submit a second draft, right? Or I do, I, tell, I do a story the next day, but I do it even better, right? I, I learned the first time to cover this story even better or more fine-tuned the next day. So when you are an editor and you're editing critically, you encourage that process that it's not one and done. It's not, I did it the right, the first time. It's iterative. You encourage people to do, improve, repeat. And then also what it means is that you question what seems to be true because a lot of things seem obvious to us, but they just may be something we're comfortable with or maybe something that has been adopted from a societal or community standpoint, but it may not be true. So that's your job if you're editing with a critical eye. Andy, go for it. Uh, so could you consider this like the scientific method of writing? Scientific. Um, is I know it's not like actually scientific, but like I know like with this with the scientific method, it's like yeah, you create something, you test it, you question it. Yeah, actually, that's a great analogy. I love that. I mean, you could consider that if that if that's a way that you conceptualize it. Yeah. Okay. Um, and I also feel like, and, you know, it's in science, you know, they're looking for a specific answer. I don't know that there's any, there's always one right answer. So like I said, it's not binary. It's not this or that or black or white. A lot of times there's gray, but I like your analogy. Yeah. All right. So let's dig a little bit deeper. Editing with a critical eye means, and I've said it before, means you ask a whole lot of questions, right? And that it challenges what seems to be true. And we'll do that later in the lesson today. And you look for imbalance, right? Meaning that maybe it favors a particular group or thing or place or point of view more than another. And it's just an unfairness about it, right? So here's my tip to you. If you are, you've got a story in front of you on your screen and you are tasked with editing, before you even read the story, write down questions that you think the story should answer. Just automatically, what do you think that this, before I read this piece, it should entail these things. It should entail the, it should answer these questions for me. And then read the article to see if that editorial piece has actually provided that information and answers to your questions. And if it hasn't, it's time to talk to the reporter or the writer or your colleague and tell them, hey, I have a question for you. What about adding this in there? That will help you when you're editing with critical eyes. So ask questions and you ask information that is missing. You look for it or you look for, um, like I said, things that are in balance. And so, for example, information, you want to ask questions about information that is imperative, meaning that it's a must have. You have to have it in there. Right. So if I'm talking about perhaps um, maybe the latest vacation spot, I have I have to say where it's located. You know, I, ha I have to describe the weather. Right? I need to describe um, how many people attend there and what the clientele looks like, how much it's gonna cost me, you know, I, things that are imperative. So look, you ask questions that derive information that's imperative, information that provides context, meaning it provides details that surround the event, the environment, the person, the place, the thing, right? Information that provides meaning. So I can now understand it. I can, I know more about it. So before COVID-19 meant nothing to us. Now with context, we understand that it's a virus and we understand how contagious it is. And we understand that a vaccine can help with that. And there's more than one vaccine. Now I, I have meaning to what COVID-19 means. Before it was, it was just something that sounded like Andy said, scientific, right? So information that makes the story relevant. Why do I care? Why do I care that I learned about COVID-19? Well, it's a public health issue. You could get sick or worse, right? So make it relevant to people. You're gonna ask those questions to say, does this information um, is it relevant to the community? Is this information relevant to the community? Is this information uh, giving people new understanding, new knowledge? Does it increase awareness? Does it notify and alert? Again, COVID-19 is a great example of that, right? We all got that two years ago, that new understanding, that new knowledge, this awareness that this virus exists and it alerted the public, right? And so that's what those stories, that writing, that information that, that we saw the media do, did. And so you're gonna ask questions that lead to that. Is, you're gonna ask the question as an editor, is this new? Does it provide new understanding and knowledge and awareness? Does it notify? And then finally, does the information complete a, com, complete a picture for somebody? Do they understand it comprehensively? Or do they understand only part of it, right? Or what you're trying to tell them? And if it's only part, 
paint paint the ask the questions that give people a complete picture, a complete understanding. Right. So always, always ask, how can I make the story better? What's missing? If you are editing with a critical eye, that's going to be one of your questions. How can I make it better? Is there anything missing? What can I add? Um, you're going to ask the questions. Always ask the questions. You're going to ask, um, would it be better in first person? So maybe somebody wrote something. Maybe it would just be better from a personal take or somebody's personal story. Would it be better if we had diverse or more voices? So instead of one source or two source, maybe we really need three or four coming from a different point of view. Um, would it be better if it's shorter? Would the story be served better if it's actually longer? We need more information. And would the what images, what pictures do we put with the story? So you start asking all these questions. What, how can I make it better? Right. All right. So here's an example. Um, so who wants to raise their hand and have fun with me on this one? <laughs> I need a volunteer. I'm waiting. Uh, I can volunteer. Okay, who said that? Tito. Tito, okay, all right, my man Tito. All right, so here's an example of you're now the editor, right? Your reporter tells you about a restaurant downtown that they wanna write about. What questions should the story answer? So give me some questions that you think the story should answer. Uh, what part of the city the restaurant's in, what type of food they have, okay. um, what it's like inside. Mm -hmm. um, Keep going. What else do you How want popular it is, how okay. long it's been there. Long, um, okay. Who the owner of the restaurant is. Okay, keep going. Um, yeah, uh, do people go there like after football games? Okay. You know, do people, are there events there? Beautiful, um, beautiful. Beautiful. I love it. You would be asking, okay, so it's not good enough, right, for the reporter to tell you that there's new, there's this new restaurant downtown and they want to write a story. What's the first thing as an editor you're going to do? He's going to ask questions. He's going to say, what questions should this should definitely be in the story? So let's take a look at some of the ones, right? And you, you touched on some of these. What kind of food do they serve? I want to know, is it burger fries? Is it filet mignon? Is it seafood, right? What kind of food? Where is it located? Which is, you said, what part of the city is it located in? How much does it cost? How much is, the, how much is this meal going to set me back? Is it something that's like a cheap eat? Is it expensive? Is it something in between? What, what's going on here? Is it a small business or is it a large chain? A lot of people care about that. Right. If it's small, like you said, who's the owner? Is it a new or old building? What's the contact information? Where's the address, the phone number? Right. The oh, I got an extra comma. Um, social media pages, website, all of that. What do people think about the food? Right. Maybe you're even the critic who writes about the food. How nice are the servers? I want to know who's the clientele. Is it businessmen? Is it retirees? Is it somewhere college students hit up? Is it family oriented? Do mostly tourists go there? I want to know who attend, who, who patrons the restaurant and when is the restaurant busy? Maybe I want to go when it first opens and nobody's there. So those are the kind of things that I'm saying when you're critically thinking, step back. If somebody gives you a story or you start to talk about the story, automatically start thinking, okay, what questions should, what, what question should we be this story be answering? And know what's imperative and know what's important. Thank you. Thank you, Tito. No problem. Uh, mm -hmm. um, oops, my bad. Hold on one sec. Okay, so, and, oops, I keep doing this. Um, another example is, have you guys heard of this with, um, um, have you guys heard of this with Obama? Um, so I, I'm going to read the, the story, but have you guys heard when Obama went to this famous Austin barbecue restaurant one time and he hit up this place. And I want, I'm gonna read this story. I want you to tell me, did this story answer questions that you would like to know about Obama and this barbecue restaurant? So let's take a look here. So I won't watch the video. Essentially the video is Obama chilling um, in this restaurant. But basically the title says, Obama hits up famed Austin barbecue restaurant, calling executive power um, not having to wait in line um, at one of Austin's most famous barbecue joints. And so it's a very small story called Executive Power. And this is President Barack Obama hit up Franklin Barbecue in the Texas Capitol Thursday after giving remarks on the economy. The restaurant is famed nationwide for its brisket and other offerings, typically attracting long lines of hungry locals and tourists 
um, hours before mealtimes, apologizing to a couple in the front of the line for cutting in front of them, Obama offered to buy them lunch, along with a big order of takeout to take on Air Force One. The total order came to $300 per the White House pool. So my question to you is, did, the, is, did this story, even though it's short, answer the questions? Well, we know, number one, that Obama came, right? That's why we care. We know that it's a famed restaurant. We know that people typically wait in line. Uh, we know that it's in Austin. They say it's in the Texas Capitol. We know why Obama was there. He was there to give remarks on the economy. We know that it's what it's known for, barbecue, brisket, other things that deal with barbecue. We know who patrons the restaurant. He, they said local, locals and tourists oftentimes come there for hours, hours. And we know they wait hours before mealtimes and they're standing in long lines. And then uh, we know a little bit of the context and the environment that the reporter saw, that he apologized to a couple, that it cost him $300, that he ordered a big, a big takeout order and he took it on Air Force One. So therefore we can presume that people on the plane ate. See how much information got packed up in a very, very small story? See how the, whoever the reporter and slash the editor was, they were able to get a whole lot in a very, very small few words. So this is what I'm encouraging you all to do, essentially. I'm encouraging you to ask the questions, what should be included? That does not mean it should be a long story. You can get a whole lot of information. And just like with this Obama example, um, and I actually saw this restaurant in Austin, people by noon, if you, don't, if you don't get barbecue by noon and not in line, early in line, you usually don't even get to eat at this restaurant. It's, it's that popular. But and President Obama, from my knowledge, is the only person who's ever gotten to cut the line. They have to be the President of the United States. <laughs> cool. All right. So next, um, an editor with a critical eye. Um, at, oh, go uh, ahead. I actually had uh, one question. Um, mm -hmm. About this or so something? So like since, no, it's like about the Obama thing. Like mm -hmm. one question I was wondering was what did he eat, you know? Or what oh, did he order at least? That's a great question. I think that's a great question. We didn't answer that. Oh, see, you would have been great if you were the editor. You could have said, did you notice what the president ate? Great, beautiful. That's exactly what I'm talking about. Um, so an editor with a critical eye asked, um, did we bury the lead? Meaning, did, did we begin with, or not begin with, meaning bury, the most important fact? It's the most important fact. It's the most intriguing part, right? Um, did we begin with helping people understand what they're about to read about, read about or what they're about to watch or what they're about to listen to? So just don't, when you, I'm sure you've heard that before, um, or if you haven't you heard it now, you don't bury the lead, meaning you don't, you don't put at the bottom the most important thing or the most newest fact or the most intriguing part of the story. And you just tell people what they're about to consume. So um, will the reader understand what you're trying to tell them? If you're editing with a critical eye, this is that giving um, context and clarity, that's, you have to make sure that people actually understand what you're writing. So is it, is it clear and it's just completely obvious what the story is about? Or is it very verbose and long and we still have no idea what you're talking about? Make it clear, make it obvious. Is the story written in a sequential way? What do I mean by that? I mean the order of it, does it have a beginning? Does it then follow a specific um, flow of events? And then we get to the conclusion or the end or what happened. It has to be sequential, it can't be all over the place. Make it follow an order, make it easy for people to follow. Um, and is the story written in a conversational tone? Meaning, is it written how people actually talk? Or is your um, TV report um, on broadcast TV or radio um, or even push notifications or anything digital? Does it actually sound like people would talk or is, is it high journalese? Um, yeah, so you wanna actually talk how people talk. That will help people understand it. It will make it clear. It will clarify, it will make it obvious. Your job is to help people understand. And so edical, editors with the critical eye, they ask reporters, four good things. Why did you choose this story, right? Well, with the restaurant idea, it's a new, it's a new restaurant downtown, it's something new. Um, 
And why did you choose the angle that you chose? You know, why did you uh, focus on this person versus that person, that political party versus this political party? That that um, why did you choose this story and not focus on the story maybe on the southwest end of Atlanta? Why did you choose what you chose? Why did you choose the angle you chose? Why did you decide to frame it? Remember, we talked about framing, giving people um, a point of view or context in a particular way. Why did you frame it the way you did? And does your audience even care? Will it help people? Will it inform people? So think about all those things when you're looking at a piece of content, creating a piece of content, working with others. All these questions should come into play. All right. Um, and then, so remember, we learned that we don't assume. Uh, so if you did assume before, you don't assume anymore, right? You don't assume that spelling is correct. You don't assume that job titles are correct. You don't assume acronyms are correct. You check everything. You don't assume that the date, the time, the addresses are correct. Instead, you're looking for inconsistencies and maybe some awkward wording. So I give an example at the bottom. This is a true story. One of my reporters wrote um, Brianna Taylor versus Brianna Taylor, and he spelled the name wrong. And so this is when Brianna, I think when the story of Brianna Taylor being shot and killed uh, by police, was coming up and he misspelled Brianna Taylor. She has a unique spelling to her name, B-R-E-O-N-N-A. That would have been an embarrassment for the newspaper in general, just to, to be that insensitive of somebody who uh, was even being used in conversations about social justice. So we just don't, we look for those inconsistencies and we don't assume that we got it right and we don't assume the reporter got it right. We look for things to make sure that they're correct. Okay. Speaking of looking for things, I'm sure you guys have heard a lot in the past year or two about bias and bias is our worst enemy in journalism. It's our worst enemy in writing. And by bias, I mean prejudice. It means that you are favoring or against something or someone or group compared to another. And it's usually considered unfair, right? Again, um, per perhaps that you prefer to hear the advice from men versus hearing and collecting reflections and advice from women, that's a bias, right? So we're gonna gut that out. And biases can take many forms. So I put several here that are commonplace that uh, sometimes seep into the writing of people. Number one, confirmation bias. It means you ignore information that just doesn't fit your own beliefs. I don't believe that. I don't seek the facts that don't support that. And in fact, if the information supports what I believe, then that's the information I'm gonna put in there. That's a bias, right? In group bias means it's unfair. Um, to um, or, or fair to a particular group, right? So perhaps we are writing something to confirm. And I've seen this actually before in real life examples where there are stories that try to confirm that white people perhaps equally um, experience violence or trauma um, or socioeconomic status problems in the same way that black people do. That is that has been written recently in a report I saw. And that's just an in-group bias. It was written by a white male reporter who wanted to believe that. So again, we have to watch out for those group biases, protecting of your own group, um, protecting of your own belief, and even a self-serving bias, a tendency to perceive yourself in an overly favorable manner. And that can happen a lot when you think you assume and you think that perhaps your story can't be better or that you can't be corrected or that perhaps you didn't get something wrong. So we're gonna have humility and recognize and look for our own biases that can creep into our work. Right. And um, I have a ridiculous, I'll, I underscore that ridiculous example of a writing. So if this would be full of bias, that meant, and this looks like it's supported with data. That's the thing. A lot of times when people write things in the news, it looks like it's, it's being supported with data. We can shape data to fit whatever you need. That men are smarter than women and whites are smarter than black people. And see, Asians, they're smarter than everybody else. So that's based on the National Center for Education Statistics, where men score higher on their SATs and whites score higher than blacks on their SATs. And Asians, they score better than everybody else in their SATs. Now, the truth of the matter is there is a center in real life called the National Center for Education Statistics. That is true. And it is true that men score higher on their SATs. And it is true that whites score higher on their um, SATs than blacks as a whole as a group. And it is true that Asians tend to score higher than other groups, but it but that cannot be used as proof that men are smarter than women, whites are smarter than blacks, and Asians are smarter than everybody else. This bias is untrue. 
So we're going to look out for biases and we're going to get them out and we're going to acknowledge that we all have them. All right. So when you edit critically, it means you analyze. We talked about this, right? Critical thinking is analyzing. You think about what the text is for, meaning what's the purpose that is there? Why is it on the page to begin with? So what is it for? Is, is that sentence or does that paragraph introduce the topic? Does it provide context, right? So I, I get new, I get information about what we're talking about. Does it explain the environment so that I know it's a, it's a rainy day, it's a sunny day, it's a crowded mall, right? Does it give me context and explain the environment? Does it give background, right? We know that Professor Smith, um, my background is, is that I have a degree in from the University of Georgia in journalism, and therefore I am qualified to teach journalism at Morehouse College, right? Give background. So maybe I want to I want to substantiate that person. Why why are we even talking to that person? Why they're included in the story? Then we describe the look and the feel. So everything that's on the page honestly should have a have a purpose. You should always be thinking about, okay, I'm going to analyze this copy, this text, this editorial, and it has to have a purpose. If it doesn't have a purpose, I would suggest that you edit it out. Okay, the last word before we get to an exercise, make sure I'm not running over time. Um, so the last word is critical thinking, connects to editing. You, this develops a critical eye and you use your critical eye to make it logical, meaning can I understand what this story is about? That you lessen the complexity, meaning I make it simple for people to understand and digest and to read. You ensure you use your critical eye to present a balanced view, meaning that there's more than one point of view. Okay. That you probe the premise, meaning that I examine when I say probe. I, I probe the, the meaning and the point of this. And I look for any assumptions that possibly lie in the copy. And then I leave people informed so they know more than they knew when they get down reading it and familiarize. And I also will add even entertain, right? So a lot of things you, you read something, maybe an entertainment article, and the, the intent is not only to inform, but it's actually to entertain people. What questions do you have before we get to um, and get to a fun example? Oh, and the quote I have for here is Malcolm X. He said this before he got onto every stage, before people introduce people would introduce Malcolm X, and he would always turn to them before they went on stage to introduce him. It's just to make it plain. He wanted people to just make it simple, comprehensible, so that when he entered um, into the arena or on the stage that people weren't confused, they understood. Make it plain, that's what I'm at, that's my cry to you. What questions do you have? Okay, that was a lot, right? Um, so here's another one. I. Need another brave soul. I'm just gonna stop sharing for a second here um, to just get a gauge of the room. It's kind of hard to do virtually, but who wants to be a volunteer? Tito did it last time, right? But So that means okay. you don't, who said that? Uh, all right, it doesn't matter. Both Justin said something, I think. <laughs> Both Justin's? <laughs> okay, yeah, so we'll go. What am a volunteer for? Yeah. You don't know what you're, good question. You have to ask what you're volunteering for. <laughs> um, so I'm going to go with Justin Evans, right? Are you ready? Okay. So yeah. I'm gonna, okay. So I'm going to share the screen and everyone is going to um, read the story. All right. Not in here. Uh, let me just put this on slideshow. Okay. So here's the story. Has anybody heard of Axios by any chance? Yes. You have? Okay, great. So Axios is, it just hit its five year anniversary, I think this week, sometime this week. And essentially they do, they're known for doing newsletters. And we'll discuss Axios later in the semester, but essentially they're known for smart brevity. That's, that's their whole premise is that we make it clear, we make it engaging, we keep it simple, we keep it conversational. And we, by the time you get done reading this short, succinct newsletter, you are informed. That's the whole premise is smart brevity. Remember I said brevity, brief, right? So we're gonna be smart and keep it brief. So here was one of the stories that landed unedited on an editor's desk, true story at Axio. So we're gonna read the original story and then I'm going to share with you how the um, editor edited it. Um, 
but not before I hear what Justin thinks um, he has questions about what was written, because there was a lot of questions about this story um, when it came across the editor's desk. So it says, pick du jour, right? Du jour meaning of the day in French, so picture of the day. Pick du jour, this is the caption. It says, it takes a rainbow man. Rainbow man protests the COVID-19 vaccine on College Avenue in Fayetteville, Arkansas, Thursday. So that's the caption. We're, we're in Arkansas, by the way. So the story says, Worth here, Worth is the reporter. The theory that the global pandemics is a host continues to persist among some. I was struck not so much by the protesters' message um, as by his commitment to expressing it per his rights. Asked to be identified only as Rainbow Man, he took to the street and stood in the sun yesterday rather than posting memes on Facebook. Though not using a name makes it easier to avoid accountability for spreading information. It takes opinions of all stripes to make up the United States, a rainbow ideas, if you will. It's good to remember that we're all in this together. And to the extent we can respect each other, we'll get through this together. So that was the story that was um, put before the editor Axios. My question to Justin is, what do you see in this? What questions do you have for the reporter? What alarms you about this story that you would ask the reporter? You can give me maybe one or two or three thoughts. Um, I know for the first one, uh, I guess, what, what was the biggest thing that struck the reporter to write this story? Obviously, <laughs> this, is, this, this wasn't something that she had like mm -hmm. already had planned but mm -hmm. you know she was going down the street and just saw it mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um so why did you choose to write this story so that's your yeah. first question mm -hmm. okay what's your next question yeah. um only had two and then the second question would be um at least for the picture when it says covid ends when you stop does that say complying i think it mm -hmm. does mm -hmm. complying mm -hmm. with it mm -hmm. um what made you choose that i, I guess i would Ask the ask the editor like what made you take that picture. Then also like mm -hmm. ask the guy like what made you choose that sign. Because a lot of okay. people have like during this pandemic, a lot of people have been having like different opinions and how right. they feel, right. and you know just like the back the backstory. So we can give the reader like more of an idea of why he's protesting about it. Let me ask you this: Why are why do you have the question? Why do you choose this story? What what makes you question the reason? or makes you think, I need to know why this person chose this story? Um, at least from, uh, from my perspective, mm -hmm. you know, we, cause this is not something that's always been new. Like, mm -hmm. like I said, it's been almost two years since we've been in the pandemic. Mm -hmm. So I, I guess for me, it was more of just like, We've seen a bunch of these stories. We've seen mm -hmm. groups. We've seen all these mm -hmm. things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Why make it? Why um? Why choose? I don't want to say random, but why mm -hmm. choose it's this guy on the street mm -hmm. who's who's by himself protesting? Mm -hmm. Usually mm -hmm. they focus towards like bigger groups, but mm -hmm. you know this mm -hmm. one's a little bit smaller. Mm -hmm. I will say, Justin, that's exactly the question the editor had. Why did you choose this random guy on a street corner protesting? COVID and if it's real or not, that was that was it. You, you hit the nail on the head. Why did you, this is what I'm saying about critically thinking, before even publishing this, why did you choose the story in the first place, right? It makes me even question what the, what the reporter's own biases are about COVID and everything that comes with that. That's exactly, you are spot on, it's exactly it. Um, and so this was what the editor edited. As you, as you can see, this is dramatically cut down. Right. And then we'll get into what the reasoning and the logic. But so pick du jour, they left the caption. Right. It takes a rainbow. It takes a rainbow man. Rainbow man protests the COVID-19 vaccine on College Avenue in Fayetteville, Arkansas, Thursday. Worth here. The theory that the global pandemic is a host continues to persist among some. That's just a true statement. I was struck not so much by the protesters message as by his commitment to expressing it. So he says why he picked the story. Asked to be identified only as Rainbow Man, he took to the street and stood in the sun yesterday rather than posting memes on Facebook. Though not using a meme makes it easier to avoid his accountability and spreading information. So let's look at what the editor said. Here are the questions that the editor asks, right? Which led to the changes in the story. Number one, why did the reporter, this is exactly what you said, Justin, choose a feature of someone, I'm sorry, hold on a second, this 
Uh, phone ringing in the background. I'll just wait till that stops. Sorry. Sorry. Okay. Okay. Right. We got like four cell phones in this house. Okay, so number one, why did the reporter worth choose the feature in the first place? And choose a feature even of someone who is spreading misinformation about COVID. You have to think about that. You have to think about why did you pick someone that is specifically spreading information? They also asked, by publishing the story, how much do we actually advocate Rainbow Man's behavior? Because he's spreading misinformation. So you have to think about that from um, an ethical standpoint. And does per his rights, so remember this, when he said he stood in the street yesterday and he's his commitment to expressing it, that's his right to express it. But she challenged that. The editor challenged that saying, does it share a bias for Rainbow Man and his belief, right? Is, it, is that objective to say per, it's, it's his rights um, to stand on the street and spread misinformation? So um, with this saying, we're all in this together. If you remember at the end of it, it says at the very last sentence, it's good to remember that we're all in this together to the extent we can respect each other and get through this together. So that the um, editor said, what is we're all in this together imply to the reader? Does this sugarcoat a very serious public health crisis? Does the story, story suggest we're all equally feeling the same effects of the pandemic because we're all in this together? Does the flag emoji, you remember the flag, now you're an American if you believe this, you are patriotic if you believe this, does the flag emoji suggest someone is patriotic and American if they agree with Rainbow Man's view? Is it responsible to share this story without acknowledging, because we did not acknowledge, right? It says that in the first one, it says that um, some pe people believe this. Um, and she says that, is it responsible to share a story without acknowledging Rainbow Man's misinformation? It hurts a lot of people. So we said, yeah, it's misinformation, but the reporter didn't say that it actually could affect people in negative ways harmful ways. And finally, um, the story was ultimately condensed. It was condensed to this short um, piece, ultimately condensed to address the concerns. And my question to Justin is, do you agree? And would you, how would you have approached the story? Would you have done it the same way that this editor did? Are you asking me that right now? Yes. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> I thought it was a rhetorical question. No. Um, do you agree with the editor the way that they process this? Uh, I would say I, I agree with, with the theme of the story because of, of us being in the pandemic, but mm -hmm. I, um, I don't agree basically of how you said earlier, it's kind of like roping this all together, <laughs> assuming that we all have the same opinions about mm -hmm what we believe in about the pandemic and all of that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So uh, thank you, Justin. Um, with that, I just want to say that this is the kind of this is the kind of thought process when I say, are you critically thinking? Stop share. Are you critically thinking about what you're writing, about what has been written, about what you take in as fact? what you believe and trust. This is, this is the kind of thinking process. Now that was a very small, short story in a, in a very small, short newsletter, but it actually sparked a whole lot of conversation, especially when we're talking about COVID and how it affects communities differently and what people believe. And it's not just COVID, right? So we have many different sides to that. Did, did that story reflect that? Did it respect that? Did it, was it responsible in the way that it told the story so that it, le it left people understanding what the truth is about this public health crisis. That's what I'm asking you all to do. I'm asking you not to just, even if it's a small piece of information, I'm asking you to think about it critically. Even if it's something small, that 150 words that I asked you to write um, for Blackboard, think about it critically, provide information because you can provide a whole lot of information if you think critically, if you edit critically um, into your copy and it will, it will serve a great purpose. It will inform others. Thoughts, reflections, go for it, Tito. Yeah, I was gonna say, um, <clears throat> uh, relating to the story that we were just looking at, um, I think Man? there could have, huh? Rainbow Yeah, Man? Rainbow Man, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. I think there could have been like a full length story if they just like would have taken a different angle. Mm -hmm. Like maybe if they would have just focused to like, 
because like at the beginning of the pandemic, there was a problem with like a lot of people spreading misinformation. Mm -hmm. So I think like the story could have been more so like just how many people are uninformed about the situation and spreading like misinformation that a goes directly against like mm -hmm. the CDC mm -hmm. or you know scientists mm -hmm. and things like that and like using Rainbow Man as like you know an extreme example and I if that would have been the story it wouldn't have been too difficult to find like other people mm -hmm. that were spreading misinformation because at the beginning of the pandemic you know a lot of people were very loud and proud about it like um, wasn't it one of the Kennedy brothers mm -hmm. that was spreading like, a whole bunch of misinformation about it so mm -hmm. yeah yeah, I like your framing. So, uh, and I'll get to you one second, um, Justin. I see your hand up, but yeah, I like your framing. Is how how are we going to use this and position this in a way that will inform people? So, if we share perhaps his story and then maybe what is not accurate about it, I love that. So basically, you're frame you're positioning it and framing the story in a different way versus just here's this guy, random guy on the street. Justin, you had a thought, Darden. Uh, yes, I don't know if anybody like acknowledged this or anything about the, uh, it was about the name of the reporter, but he didn't mm -hmm. really put his like first name, mm -hmm. and I think you're supposed to put your whole name as a reporter in your so, article. That's a good thought. So with this one in Axios, if you read Axios, a lot of it is mm -hmm. very um, regular, loose language. So the way that they write it is, is that it's like, hey girl, you know, it's just oh, very, it's just very, yeah. Um, um, yeah, and so that, again, that's context, what you're talking about, even just even being able to discern that, but essentially they, they're writing it in that way because it's, um, it's supposed to be very conversational, relaxed. But that's uh, a good point because actually um, other students have pointed out, they wonder if you should have like this, hey, Worth here, because it's very cheeky, lighthearted, and maybe that's not the story to do that. Yeah, it was kind of weird to me. Yeah. yeah, you're not the only person who's had that thought. <laughs> Okay, so that's my story. I'm sticking to it. Um, do you guys have any thoughts you want to share from today's class or you good? I'll take that resounding silence as I'm good and ready to go 15 minutes early. So, <laughs> um, okay, so I'm excited about the rest of um, the rest of what are we on Thursday. So next week, because you're actually going to get a chance. There is no class on the day that there's Blackboard. So let me see what day that is. Um, yeah, one second. No, actually I'll stop recording so that you don't.